Hey patent friends, welcome back to another video. This is the patent and inventing playbook and I'm gonna give you all the details that I have on inventing and protecting ideas and inventions with patents and specifically how to tailor a patent strategy for your business or company. So stick around, we are starting right now. So I'm giving a talk tomorrow at the King County Bar Association and this is my dry run and I wanna record it for, uh, for all of you. So um, let, let's kind of get into what we're going to be talking about. So the first thing is kind of what is patentable, um, sort of where patents fit into intellectual property in general, why patents are important. I think people realize that patents are, you know, are valuable things that are important to protect and ideas and inventions, but don't really necessarily realize why, or at least why, it, it, why they're important for, say, startups, for instance. Going to give you a, an overview of the patent process and then talk about different patent strategies and specifically talk about patent strategies for big companies for startups for small individual inventors and people with uh, consumer products and how those strategies differ and it's important to understand all of those because regardless of whether you're a startup or an individual inventor um, you know it's under it's good to understand how these uh, different strategies are the same in some ways and how they're different in some ways so you pick the right one for you also talk a bit about patent or prior art searching, whether it's something you need to do, whether it's essential, whether it's a standard part of the patent process. Also infringement analysis, which is totally different than prior art or patent searching. Do you infringe on other people's patents? Is that a standard part of the inventing process and how do you navigate that? Also early stage issues with inventing. And I'm gonna talk about, this is a really important thing, so be sure to stay or stick around to the end because I'm gonna talk about how to not forfeit your patent rights inadvertently. There's some important things you need to do early on to make sure you don't totally forfeit your patent rights or lose the ability to patent something altogether. So um, that's gonna be the important thing kind of at the end. So for those of you who are new here, my name is Dylan Adams. I'm a patent attorney, um, author of the best-selling book, Patents Demystified, which is an insider's guide to protecting ideas and inventions. Um, also, you may recognize me from my appearance on CNBC's hit show, The Prophet with Marcus Lemonis. So uh, my practice as a patent attorney is focused on patent prosecution. And that's sort of a fancy way of saying I focus on uh, doing patent strategy, so uh, determining how to structure a patent portfolio, what inventions to protect, drafting and filing patent applications, filing those at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and working them through the examination process, hopefully until they issue as a patent. I do a bit of consulting as well related to uh, infringement uh, litigation, so whether it's defense or offense, but mostly it's going to be the patent prosecution, that is, you know, crafting uh, patent portfolios and drafting patent applications. So as a patent attorney, I have to understand technology as well, if not better than my client. So I have a master's in electrical engineering and an undergrad degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, those are the important things to be able to uh, understand um, the inventions as well as clients. All right, so let's go ahead and get right into it. So. Patents are one of four types of IP or intellectual property. So you can see here, so there's patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Patents and copyrights in a lot of ways are kind of diametrically opposed. Patents cover utilitarian things, whereas copyrights are gonna cover artistic works, okay? Trademarks are kind of off on their own. They protect things like logos and slogans, uh, product names, business names, and they, do, they do, and they do so very specifically in relation to certain goods or services. Then there's trade secrets, which can kind of cover a little bit of everything, especially in early stages. So for instance, trade secrets are a way to protect things before you patent them. You keep them secret and then you will file a patent application on it. Trade secrets can also cover things that you know aren't gonna be covered by patents, copyrights, or trademarks, things like formulas and recipes and processes, client lists, um, and you know, and sort of no business know-how that's not gonna be protected by uh, patents, copyrights, and trademarks. Okay, so what what is a patent basically? I mean, what's the basic right of one? And that's to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, or uh, importing the invention into the United States. And it's important to understand that this is not a right to actually do something. So patent, again, does not give you the right to actually do something. It's an exclusionary right. And the example I typically give is, let's say that you patent a formula of a pharmaceutical or a method of using a pharmaceutical to treat cancer. That doesn't give you the right to actually do that. You would have to go to the FDA and get approval to use the drug in that sort of way. So the patent doesn't actually give you the right to do those things. 
Okay, so that's sort of the, the right to exclude or the monopoly, and that's sort of the first thing that people think about when it comes to patents. But really, that's one of the one of the least important things for most companies. You know, it's not all about enforcing rights. It's not about having that monopoly. So here are the other things that patents can do. For, so for instance, licensing. What you can do is you can allow others to use the patented technology, and they'll pay you a royalty or they'll pay you, you know, upfront fees. There's a lot of ways to structure that. Licensing can, you know, be totally varied. It's really, you know, any way that you want to do it. You retain the rights to the patent, but then you give others the right to do it. It could be exclusive or non-exclusive. That would be licensing uh, the, the patented technology. You can also sell patents as well. So that's where you would, you would sell the, the patent that you own to another company. Um, it also creates book value in a company as well. So that can be used as collateral for, for loans or in, value, in evaluation. So for instance, um, if you're looking for investors, how much are you worth as a company to the investors? Um, patents are definitely a major part of that. So you know, aside from those things, some of the most important aspects of having a patent or a patent application are these sort of soft benefits that a lot of times people overlook, which tend to be the most important in early stages and for early stage companies. So the first is positive marketing purposes. So it's gonna be positive for attracting investors, customers, clients, and even collaborators and employees. Uh, patents and a patent application and pat patent portfolio is a great way to mark your company as being innovative as being special and so it's really uh, attractive to folks okay so on the other hand of that it's instilling fear in competitors so just being able to say you're patent pending or you have a patent a lot of times people don't understand what patent pending mean ver versus patented and you get a lot of benefit in scaring people off. You don't even have to enforce your patent rights in order to kind of scare off potential competitors. People say, well, you know, it's patented or it's patent pending. I, I'm hesitant to get into the market, you know, with, with those sort of similar products or technology. Okay, so in addition, you get protection against other people patenting similar things. So when a patent application publishes or when a patent application issues as a patent, it'll become public. And these publications can be used against other people when they try to uh, get a patent of their own on similar technology. And I'll kind of go into this later on in the patent process, but if so, let's say somebody files a patent application on something that's really similar, a patent examiner would look, look at their patent application and they would be, be very likely to find your published patent application or issued patent that published and be able to reject that patent application saying it's not it's not new or it's obvious in view of prior art, including your published patent application or patent okay also there's the idea of sort of this IP arms race and so the best uh, the best offense is a good defense and so the best way to ward off potential folks who may try to sue you, who may have their own patent portfolio, is having one of your own, okay? So it creates a situation where it's sort of the, you know, the nuclear option where there's mutually assured destruction if everybody sues each other with their patent portfolios. So a lot of times these companies will say, hey, well, well let's cross license, or maybe one company will buy another. So th the way you can set that up is by having an arsenal of your own patents or patent applications, and that can ward off other folks who may have their own patents or uh, patent applications. Okay, so what does it take to get a patent? So the main requirements are it has to be patentable subject matter, and that's a lot of times fairly simple. So you know, is it a is it a book or is it a logo? Well, no, that's going to be copyrights or trademarks. And I'll talk about it in in the next slide. But there's things that are sort of on the edge are things like abstract ideas and certain types of software. Um, so in addition to being patentable subject matter, it has to be adequately described in the patent application. That's usually a fairly low bar as long as you're working with a patent attorney. You have to provide the right details. They're usually not hard to provide. It's usually not difficult to do that, but you have to provide the right details. It's something that people a lot of times mess up if they try to file provisional or non-provisional patent applications themselves, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later on. Um, so if people try to do it themselves, they don't provide the right details, they don't provide enough detail, and that can lead to uh, patent applications being rejected. So when it really comes down to where the rubber hits the road, if you will, in the patent examination process, the examiner is going to determine whether the, uh, the claimed subject matter is new and non-obvious compared to prior. And that's really where all the difficulty comes in the patent process typically. 
that's where the rejections are, um, and that's what either you know is going to make or break the patent application uh, being allowed and potentially issuing as a patent. So new or being novel is a question of, is there one piece of prior art that totally describes your invention? And that could be an issued patent, it could be a published pending patent application, it could be blog posts, scientific papers, uh, YouTube videos, I mean really any sort of technology disclosure can be prior art. Okay, so novelty a lot of times, yeah, there's not gonna be one thing that's exactly like what you have. That's why obviousness tends to be really the difficult thing. And so the, the non-obviousness standard is, would it be obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art, that being your average person who works in the field, to come to your invention knowing about all the prior art that exists. And the way it kind of works in examination is the examiner is gonna find a bunch of prior art, pull elements from it and say, well, okay, I found a piece of your invention here, I found it here, I found it here. It would be obvious to combine those things, pull all those pieces from this prior art and come to your invention. And that's the obviousness standard. Okay, so what do utility patents cover? Really any sort of Use, useful things, utilitarian things. So it's mechanical devices, software, apps, web services, biotechnology, electronics, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing methods, games. I mean, really the list uh, goes on. So another thing I kind of want to talk about is there's a lot of bad information out there about ideas and software being patentable. And so, you know, you'll see stuff online where people say, no, ideas are not patentable or software is not patentable. And I will tell you that is absolutely untrue. Let me start with software. And I'll say one thing is I saw, I, I patent software day in and day out. That's the bread and butter of what I do, okay? But it's all about the language that you use. And this kind of gets a little bit technical. Um, look, look at some of my other videos about what patent claims are. But so for instance, you know, I have this example here. So, you know, you, you, you can't claim a, for instance, a software product that performs functions X, Y, and Z. That's going to be rejected. That's, you know, that's going to be that subject matter eligibility where the examiner is saying, no, that's, that's not eligible to be patented and will be totally correct. So that application will be rejected. Whereas if you, if, if, you, if you have claims that say a computer con, uh, configured to perform the functions X, Y, Z, or a computer implemented method that includes the steps of X, Y, Z, totally patentable, okay? So that's where the, the, this question of patenting software, you know, really kind of gets messed up by patent attorneys. They provide, provide the technical answer, which is, which it sure is right that software itself is not literally patentable, but aren't providing the good answer that, yeah, it's, it's, you can effectively easily patent software and related things, that, that's not a problem. Similar to ideas, ideas can totally be patentable, okay? It's only things that are say abstract ideas or just a formula or, or just a, a general idea without any details. Those things can't be patented. Really, that doesn't answer most clients' questions. Like folks come to me and they say, hey, I have an idea for this product, it's gonna have these things, it's gonna have these features, and you can fill in the, the, the specific details, right? Remember, that's one of the requirements is that you have to have, have it be adequately described. A lot of times, it's not that hard to fill in those details, and so something that is, you know, maybe even a, a rudimentary idea that, you know, is maybe just sketches on paper, that, that can totally be patentable, assuming those ideas can be filled in, okay? I mean, I've, I've, I've definitely filed patent applications off of nothing more than scribbles on a cocktail napkin. So basic ideas can definitely be patented if you can fill in the relevant details. One thing that can be kind of difficult is things like, uh, like business methods. So um, things like related to marketing or pricing, financial methods, a lot of times, you know, those are seen as just sort of organizing human activity and, you know, can be rejected and it can be difficult to get those through. Maybe if it's done on a computer in some sort of special way. But, you know, I really wouldn't worry too much about that stuff. If you have something that's utilitarian, that is an idea, that's software related, um, talk to a patent attorney and ask if it's going to be patentable. That's the best way to know whether what you have is going to be patentable or not. And a lot of times, things that people don't think are patentable totally are going to be. Okay, so let's talk about the two ways to start the patent process. And this is gonna be really important when planning patent strategy. So deciding what application you're gonna file first to start the patent process is really critical. And if you don't do it the right way, you set yourself up for failure early on, okay? So on this first line here, you're gonna see you, you can start with what's called a non-provisional patent application, okay? So you have an idea, 
you draft and file this formal non-provisional patent application. It waits in line for say one to three years at, at the patent office before examination begins. And really that's just, you're waiting in line. It's a government, things are really, really slow. And the line that you're sitting in is one to three years long. That's the only reason why it takes one to three years for examination to begin. Okay, so one of the things to note about this non-provisional application, it's the formal application that has to have the formal line drawings, has a long detailed description and has to have uh, claims and is gonna be typically an attorney drafted um, sort, of, you know, sort of work product if you're doing it the right way. Okay, so th this is really expensive. A lot of times it's gonna be ten dollars to $18,000 to draft and file this application, which, you know, as I'll kind of get to, doesn't make very much sense for early, a lot of early stage companies. Okay, so getting back to it. So you file the non-provisional, waits in line for one to three years, examination process begins, and that can be months and sometimes another several years of back and forth with the examiner until hopefully the examiner allows the case you pay an issue fee and then it issues as a patent, okay? So a good way to think about the examination process is it's like any sort of negotiation. Think about Pawn Stars or American Pickers where you're gonna go in with an offer of claims that you know isn't quite what you're entitled to and the examiner is then gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to negotiate and the examiner is gonna say, well, you know, you're not entitled to quite such you know, broad claim scope and then you have to kind of come together where you're getting over that hurdle of patentability and hopefully you're getting the broadest claim scope. So a negotiation during examination is actually a good thing. That's how you get the broadest patent possible. Okay, so that's starting with a non-provisional patent application. Like I said, they're really expensive. You know, you're, you're paying ten to eighteen thousand dollars a draft and file these things, and then you have additional costs, the back and forth with the examiner that the attorney has to be involved in. That can be thousands of dollars for each response, and there can be, you know, sometimes two, three, four, or more of these responses that your attorney is going to do, which is a lot of cost. So if only there was a way that you could sort of defer these costs a bit, and luckily there is, and that's the second uh, way to start the patent process, and that's the second one down below here. So it's starting with what is called a provisional patent application. And generally, you know, you can see that the, the process is fairly similar. So you have an idea, then you'll draft and file this provisional patent application. So the nice thing about provisional patent applications is that they don't have all these formal filing requir requirements. It's a, it's a document that a lot of times, and this is what I do with clients, is I will have them draft an invention disclosure that I will then scrub and, and remove limiting language from, do some basic formatting, and we'll file that as a provisional patent application. That can be in the thousands of dollars instead of you know 10,000 and up and can be an easy way to get patent pending status, okay? So the provisional application, it's just a placeholder. It only lasts for one year. It automatically expires at the end of the year and that term can't be extended. That's when you then have to file a non-provisional patent application that claims priority to that provisional application, okay? And then really the, the, the process is about the same. So, you know, non-provisional waits in line for one to three years before examination begins. Examination begins and there's a negotiation with the examiner. Hopefully the examiner allows the case. You pay an issue fee and then it issues as a patent. So I'm gonna get into this a little bit later, but it, it's re this can be really important and pretty you know standard in a lot of ways for startups and small companies because the, with the provisional, it can be cost-effective way to get patent pending status and it gives you a year to do market testing, to do R&D, and then you can add more details at the non-provisional stage. Another thing we can you can do is, and we'll, we'll do this frequently, is let's say you file the provisional and six months later, you come up with all sorts of new things, you wanna get a priority date for that, we'll just file an updated provisional six months down the road and then at the year anniversary from the first provisional, we'll file the non-provisional and then maybe even have more updates. That's a really good Way, great way to incrementally protect ideas as you're going along, as you're doing R&D, as you work with investors and you know, realize that some things work and some things don't. That can be really important to sort of you know, be able to incrementally protect something instead of just you know, say if you were to start with the non-provisional, then you would have to file a whole new application every time you come up with something. You don't have this, you know, this window of opportunity to, to update things and sort of get uh, incremental uh, protection along the way. Okay, so let's talk about uh, patent strategy of different folks. And I usually put it sort of into three different buckets. One is gonna be large patent portfolios. And these are folks who are, I mean, they're, they're filing thousands of patent applications a year, if you know, hundreds, you know, sometimes maybe on the low side. But it's, these are large, large patent portfolios. The Amazons, IBM, Samsungs, Microsofts of the world, folks like that, okay? Then there are startups. And I'll kind of talk about what, you know, how I define startups 
Um, they're, they're sort of uh, growth companies who rely on investors to, to grow. And they're going to be uh, different than individual in, inventors and small consumer products. This is going to be, maybe it's a, you know, a, a large business or a business that has a lot of uh, a lot of products, but for small products that themselves don't like, may, you know, don't have a lot of revenue associated with them, the the strategy for protecting those things can be very different, um, just because it's you know you're doing different things than say a startup would. Same with s- s- individual inventors, you know, who aren't looking to grow and scale. They have different needs than startups. Okay, so let's start with the large uh, patent portfolio and and see w- how how we do that okay so uh, you know w- with with my clients i i work with clients of all sizes whether they be fortune 100 companies startups shark tank companies um, individual inventors I, I, and i deal with all sorts of technology so i have experience with all of these types of clients now you may not be a large company you know like ibm or lg or intel but it's important to understand their patent portfolio and how that difference dif- differs from what you are going to be doing and why okay so like i said i mean th- these are folks who are filing say 50 you know hundreds if not thousands of patent applications per year and a good way to think about it it's kind of like angel or vc investment and for those of you who aren't really familiar with how angel or VC investing works is they invest in a ton of companies. And let's say, for instance, they, they invest in 20 companies. They know that the vast majority are going to fail. Like, let's say you know, 10 out of 20 are totally going to fail. They're going to lose their investment on that. Okay? Maybe there's going to be another, say, five companies who are going to maybe break even. All right, they, they won't lose their money, but they're really not going to make any money. Then there's maybe four out of 20 that maybe they'll do okay, they'll make a little bit of money, but they're not going to be huge home runs. It's really only going to be that one in 20 companies, maybe even less, that's really the big home run. That's the million, billion dollar company that really makes these investors a lot of money. And that's how these big patent portfolios are kind of created as well. You file on uh, you know all sorts of ideas, whether they're going to be commercial products or not, whether there's just general ideas in in the technology space of, of the company. You file on everything, okay? So you know you file on everything, knowing that a lot of stuff is going to be worthless. You're just going to lose your money. These are going to be you know patents that you know nobody really uses, nobody cares about. Some are going to you know some are going to make a little bit of money, um, whereas it's only going to be maybe the one in twenty, one in fifty patents. It's going to be the million dollar, billion dollar patent that really makes. A, a, an amazing patent portfolio. Okay, so with these companies, they're going to start the patent process with non provisional patent applications typically. They don't need to waste the time and money on a provisional patent application. They have the budget just to file the non provisional. If they come up with new updates, fine, we'll file a new non provisional. Um, that, that, that's not a big deal, okay? So with, with, with these sort of companies, budget is definitely less of an issue. And like I said, so you just file on everything. You file as soon as possible. It doesn't matter whether you are you know, actually going to be launching the product. Obviously, you would want to you know, f- file something before you launch a product. And I'll talk about this later on, that you lose patent rights upon public disclosures, public user offers for sale if you don't file a patent application. Um, and so they'll certainly do that. But a lot of times, you, know, it's, you, know, you invent something, file a patent application. Um, and you know, and you do that on an ongoing basis. All the engineers in the company are filing invention disclosure forms, and you're essentially mining new inventions for patents all the time. Okay, and so when you're drafting these applications and going through the examination process, it's a focus on high quality enforceable patents. And so, w- a lot of times, it, it makes sense to drag out the examination process. You can take a long time, and that's okay. You want to really negotiate hard to make sure that you have the broadest. A patent scope possible. That's what these companies really want because they want them to be enforceable. They want to be able to license them. They want to be able to enforce them against competitors. So they really want to make sure that they're solid assets. Okay. This is important for, say, like I said, cross licensing, um, defending against people if you need to, um, you know, f- file a lawsuit, a counter lawsuit with your patent portfolio, or if you need to enforce against somebody who's, who's copying what you have. Um, and for, for companies like this, the strategy really stays the same the whole time. It's not really all that different. Like I said, you're just churning out new patent applications all the time that the uh, in, inventors are coming up with new stuff and you file patent applications just one after the other. Okay, so that's large companies. Now, st- startup patent portfolio strategy is, is, is very different. So, so startups are early stage growth companies that scale with investors, okay? And this, these can be companies that are at you know any stage in that process 
whether it's a friend, self-funded or friends and family funding, or it's a, you have a seed round where you get a little, you know, a little bit of capital, Series A round. But really, it's it's going to be a company that's going to grow and then is ultimately going to have some sort of exit strategy, right? That's going to be being acquired by a company, going public, something like that. And it's going to be an exit where these investors are going to be able to get a return on their investment. These are typically not companies that are just going to you know, perpetuate and, you know, be companies ongoing. A lot of times they're going to have an exit, although sometimes that ends up being the business strategy where these companies, you know, will just stay in business and don't, uh, you know, don't go public or, or don't actually sell to another company. Okay. So a lot of times these can be small patent portfolios, maybe one to 10 patent applications per year, maybe more than that. But a lot of times it's really not that many. And for startups, I mean, you know, regardless of where you are on that spectrum of, of the life cycle of a startup, budget is always, of a, always a concern. And that's why I enjoy working with startups the most is because you always have to really do this bespoke work and really be cognizant of the, the budget that folks have and be able to scale with that budget. In the beginning, you have to be really, really budget conscious. And then you have to, you have to leave open options so that you can expand the portfolio once you get more capital and then be able to expand it more once you get additional capital. That's the fun of working with startups is that it's always changing. Budget is always a concern and, you know, worrying about how to craft it for, for investors, things like that. So with, with startups, they're typically going to focus on protecting the core uh, products or, or business methods that the, that the company has. They don't have the budget and the luxury to be able to just patent general sort of white space patenting things around you know their product in the general technology area. A lot of times it's going to be fairly focused on their products, and and a lot of times it will focus on you know the new products they come up with, more detail they have in the products. That's how you tend to expand the patent portfolio of of startups. And you have to with with startups you have to sort of build in the ability to scale the patent portfolio with their growth. Okay, that's that's kind of a concern. You you, you want to you know have a lot of description in there so you can file a single big application, but later on split that off into continuations and expand the patent portfolio. It's a bit sort of out of the scope of of, of this video, but I have some good other videos that talk about that sort of strategy of how to scale a patent portfolio as startups grow. So the biggest thing with startups is deferring cost and maintaining flexibility. That is really, really important. Um, so you know the name of the game is you know wait as long as you can to file patent applications. It's kind of counterintuitive, but um, it makes a lot of sense to only file when you're about to make public disclosures, public uses, or offers for sale, or when you're about to uh, approach investors. That's typically the best time to file patent applications. You want to file your provisional patent application then because that defers the you know the time you know of a year that then you have to file that really expensive non-provisional also defers the cost related to the examination process which is also going to be expensive so for startups it's better to wait and delay all of those costs wait until you have more certainty around the product around the market and and of course until you have more budget whether it's from investors or actually having sales things like that it's important to make sure that you have that capital so you can appropriately scale the patent portfolio okay so in addition to deferring costs and maintaining this important flexibility you want to craft a patent portfolio for startups to attract investors. That's one of the key things about startups is the IP is not really used for enforcing against other folks. You know, a lot of times startups don't have the bankroll to file patent lawsuits or it's it's typically a you know a fairly new uh, landscape with new products and there's really there may not even be competitors out there. Competitors may come in later. So the enforcement and having a monopoly really isn't a concern. What a concern is is creating a patent portfolio that has good optics and that is is good for marketing to tr attract investors or other collaborators. You know whether they be uh, you know if folks who are going to give you grants, it's going to be uh, employees, it's going to be customers, things like that. You want to craft a patent portfolio that's going to be attractive to those folks. Okay. So, and like I said, you're almost always going to be starting with a provisional patent application. Again, that's that's the best way to defer all those costs related to the the expensive non-provisional and related to the uh, to the examination process. Okay, so then individual inventors and small consumer products. So this is going to be maybe an individual or a small group that doesn't really need investors to grow. They can 
manufacture these products themselves, or maybe you know they can you know do it offshore in a factory or something. But they but they don't really need investors in order to scale the company. Okay, so you don't have this issue then with having to, to attract investors. But in a lot of ways, um, the the issues with these sort of companies or with these sort of individuals is fairly similar to to startups. Okay, and and to be honest, for a lot of these folks, patent applications may not be really be worth it. With with startups, the optics of having patent applications is extremely important and almost essential. You almost have to file patent applications. That's how you get traction. That's how you get investors. It's a key part of the startup life uh, life cycle. Whereas for small companies and you know ones where you know they don't necessarily need it for the marketing and optic purposes. Um, you know, it may not make a lot of sense to file a patent application at all. You know, like I said, you know, it's going to be tens of thousands of dollars a lot of times to get all the way through the examination process. And if a product really isn't going to have revenue that's going to be more than that, it may not make any sense to even file a patent application. And that's something that I try to consult on with folks with small products is thinking about, well, does it even make sense to do this? Why are you filing? A patent application here. You know, if you're trying to go into it in, you know, trying to, you know, be able to enforce a patent, you know, for small companies, that can be really, really difficult. Even startups with a decent amount of capital don't usually have the funds to be able to support big patent litigation. They can't even do it. It's really difficult for small folks to enforce patent rights. But if they're looking for, um, say, patent pending status or patents to scare off competitors or for positive marketing benefits, that can be really useful and it can make then a lot of sense to file patent applications. Okay, Th That can be one of the biggest benefits for those folks. But if they're going into it thinking, you know, hey, I, I want to be able to enforce this, that's the, that's the only thing I'm going to be able to use this patent for, you know, th th you may need to think about the return on investment that patents are actually going to give you. Okay, and I want to talk about some issues with sort of these business plans that a lot of folks may have related to just pure licensing or or patenting stuff and selling patents. Okay, so it kind of comes down to the value of ideas. So honestly, there's very little value in in bare ideas. A lot of it is in the execution of the ideas and patenting and 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 getting value out of uh, just bare ideas is. You know, it's it's really difficult to sell ideas and 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 products that are really complex. You know, maybe if something is really simple, like if you could, you know, go to Home Depot and make a prototype, or you have stuff around the house where you can make a prototype. It's it's really easy to to, to create and really easy to demonstrate. You know, then it may you know then it may be totally possible to license or sell something like that. The example I always give, and you know, the, or the resource that I always uh, refer to folks is, uh, as you can see on this slide, is Stephen Key's One Simple Idea. He, his 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 book is the number one resource that you know, as far as that I've found, as far as uh, learning how to license and sell ideas and simple inventions. Um, there, there's definitely a lot to it. It's not just something that's really simple, like, oh yeah, I'm just going to go off and I'm going to sell my ideas. There's a there, it's it's really difficult to do, but you can learn how to do it, and people can be successful at doing it. Part of it is picking the right ideas, learning how to appropriately approach companies, what companies to actually approach. Um, it, it's you know you can learn those skills, but for ideas that are really complex, a lot of times that's going to be difficult, if not impossible. I have folks who come to me a lot of times saying, "Hey, I have this idea for a new cell phone app." Um, and I want to go to Google, and I want to, you know, I want to tell them about this, you know, this new website idea or this new app idea, things like that. And it's like, well, you know, a lot of times there's not going to be a lot of value in something like that because the difficulty is in actually executing that. And I think a lot of people don't appreciate how difficult it is to take something from a kernel of an idea to do web development to create these things. I mean, it can take huge teams of people many years to do it. And so folks like Google are going to look at like that and be like, well, yeah, I mean, okay, that's an interesting idea, but you know, where's the team that's actually going to execute this idea? You know, I, we, we, you know, va the value of ideas we come, we, we don't, we come up with these ideas all the time. The value isn't in the idea; it's in the execution. If you're not a person who can actually execute those things, there's really not going to be much value in those things. Okay. So also with you know, if, for folks who want to patent something and sell issued patents. That is extremely, extremely risky, and not something that I recommend as far as a business model goes. You know, I, I think that folks should try to sell things when their their applications are just pending. And to be honest, if if you don't get traction with selling an invention while a patent application is pending, 
it's very unlikely that you're gonna you know, sell it even when it's patented. That doesn't really make as much of a difference as you would think. A lot of my clients, they sell ideas, they sell companies, they get tons of traction just when things are patent pending. So having an issue patent isn't really, uh, you know, isn't really important. And for the folks who wanna go through the whole patent process, spend tens of thousands of dollars, that's a lot of money to spend. That's a lot of risk to take on, and it's a long time frame. So, you know, the pe people who I, I really don't recommend, you know, these business plans where people want to just patent something and then try to sell the issued patent. A lot of times, that's a recipe for for disaster. Okay, so I want to talk about patent and prior art searching, and it's a big misconception. But patent and prior art searching is not a standard part of the inventing and patent drafting process. Okay, people always think, hey, and it, and it kind of, you know, and it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that, okay, well, you know, if I'm gonna file a patent application, I wanna know whether it's gonna be patentable by doing a prior art search. Okay, and it, the rationale here is like, well, so the patent examiner is gonna do their own prior search and determine whether the idea is new and non obvious compared to the prior art. I should go and I should figure out what the prior art is and determine patentability and whether I should even file this patent application. Surprisingly, the value of doing a prior art search and doing it right and having an attorney do it or a search company do it, the, the, your, your return on investment is going to be really, really low and doesn't typically result in actionable information. I mean, a lot of times I can draft these, uh, the, these letters, you know, the prior art analysis letters before you even do the analysis. Okay, it's typically going to be, hey, we found some things that are similar. It's hard to tell whether this, you know, one examiner or not is going to think that this is, you know, think this is allowable. There's a lot of hidden prior out there, and you know, we don't really know. That's, you know, 98% of the prior art searching that comes back is going to be in that boat. You're not going to have anything actionable. It's going to be like, well, let's just file the application, which is typically the better thing to do. So a lot of it is there's there's a misconception that, you know, patents are a binary thing that's either having a patent or not. But really, patents. Provide a, can provide a spectrum of protection. You can have patents that are really broad that cover a lot of different variations, or you can have patents that are so specific and so narrow to one very, very specific product that they're effectively worthless in the sense that it would almost be impossible for somebody to happen to have a product that was so specific and exact like, that was exactly like that, or it'd be super easy for them to make some tiny little change and design around that patent, okay? So that, that's, that's sort of the thing, is that it's not just, you know, it's patentable or it's not. It's a question of where on that spectrum is it going to be? Are you going to get be able to get a broad patent? Is it going to have to be really narrow? A lot of times you're not going to know where, where that's going to be, even if you do a prior search. It depends on the exam you get. One examiner is going to say, oh yeah, this is totally patentable. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a really broad patent and it's going to be really easy for you. Whereas another examiner would say, well, I found a bunch of prior art and I think it'd be obvious to combine, you know, all of these pieces of prior art. I can find all the elements of what you have there. I'm not going to even let you have a patent at, at all, or I'm going to, maybe I'll let you have one, but it's going to have to be so narrow and so specific, it's going to be effectively worthless. You really don't know until you get into examination. Um, patentability is, is definitely in the details of things too. So, you know, people do a prior art search on some sort of broad concept. It doesn't really do you much good because you don't a lot of times have the specific details of what the product actually is. And if you do something a little bit different, it may be patentable. Or you do something different and it may not be patentable. It's it's sort of cart before the horse. It's better to, you know, actually create the product and you know, maybe then you would do the prior search, but then you've already created the product, it's better than just to file the patent application. So it's it's very cart before, cart before the horse. You don't have the details when you want to, the, to, to do the prior search that could actually give you actionable information. Um, you know, it, it, it typically is better to just file your patent application and let the examiner frame the issues. That's the better way to go about it. Don't spend all the time and all the money on doing some sort of speculative prior art search, that doesn't really help you. Another thing to realize is that a, a lot of patents are uh, patents and pat, or patent applications are held in secret by default for 18 months. Okay, so you could do a prior art search, but there could be prior art that is right there that you know totally is relevant to what you're doing. But when you do the search, it's it's hidden from you. Okay, so the default is 18 months from when they file the patent application. That can be all the way up until the application issues as a patent. So there's always going to be this huge blind spot of prior art that you're not going to be able to find. It's going to be hidden to you. Okay, so it's another reason why you know it just doesn't make sense to spend all the money and time doing these things. Um, and if 
and, and, and if you ask me, it's a way that patent attorneys upsell, upsell their clients. They use the fear and people assume it's sort of a standard part of the application process to do this prior art searching. They'll say, of course I'll take your money and let's do some patent and prior art searching. Sounds good to me. I'm not a big fan of doing that because that doesn't set companies up for success. You know, only in rare cases where you are going to get a return on investment do I suggest doing uh, patent or prior art searching. But when it comes down to it, you know, honestly, especially for, for startups, and this is going to sound crazy, but patentability does not matter. Let me say that again. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter a lot of time whether the invention is ultimately patentable. And that may sound totally insane to you, but let me kind of go back to the patent process again. So you file the provisional application. It's a year before you file the non-provisional patent application. It'll be another one to three years before examination begins. And that examination process could be months, if not you know, years, until you get to a final determination that, okay, this isn't patentable. All right. So you are, you are patent pending during that whole time. All right. So I've had a lot of clients who they have, they have gotten substantial traction by getting big investors, closing multiple rounds with investors. They have even made exits where they've sold the company or, you know, or, or you know, somehow you know, gone public or something before their patent applications are even issued. Okay? So a lot of times that issue of whether it's patent or not isn't relevant to ultimate success. Uh, and I've even had folks who end up abandoning their patent applications because we're like, look, we, we made the money we want. We're getting market traction. We don't really need this. You know, the investors, for some reason, don't care about it. And it, it doesn't even matter whether something is patentable. Okay. So, you know, it, it, that's one of the big misconceptions. You know, you have to have patents. It has to be patentable. We need to know that up front. It, it, it doesn't usually make a difference. Just file the patent applications. That's what's important to investors. That's what's important to get you traction. Not ultimately, a lot of times, whether it's patentable or not. Okay. The exception, though, is for simple products where you're really focusing on a single point of novelty, things that you know don't have a lot of complexity. That's where some prior art searching can be useful. And I'm not saying that there aren't a few cases uh, where I would recommend doing it, but for the vast majority of clients that I work with, honestly, I can't remember the last time I did a patent or prior art search. I also can't remember the, you know, the last time when you know, I wasn't surprised, you know, I, when, I, when I was surprised by the prior art that came out, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I didn't think that there was going to be stuff like out, like that out there. There's always going to be prior art that's going to be relevant and that's going to be similar. It's usually more an issue of, you know, where you are in that spectrum of protection. Are you going to be able to get a broad patent or are you going to be able to get a narrow patent? That's usually where you fall. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we forego patent searches. I mean, I would say in 99% of the cases, we don't do patent searching at all. It makes more sense just to file the patent application. Another thing to note is that you know this is not the same as market research, and I am absolutely not saying that you should not look at other products and not know what's going on in a competitive landscape. You know, even understanding what other competitors are doing in terms of patent portfolios, how they're structuring patents, things like that, that can be really valuable information. But doing all this analysis to determine, you know, whether your invention is patentable or not, whether we should file patent applications, th that should not be a part of the patent application process. But it should absolutely be part of sort of the market analysis uh, part of of the business. That can be really important and essential in a lot of ways, especially when you're pitching to investors. They're going to want to know what the competitive landscape is. They're going to want to know, hey, what are other people doing in the, in, in, in the field? You know, what are their products like? Are they patented? They're probably going to want to know those things. But again, you don't need to do the analysis of whether your invention is patentable or not. That's typically not, not, not important. Okay, so it's important to understand the difference between patentability and infringement. And what I was just talking about was patentability. The question there is, are the patent claims in an application new and non-obvious in view of the prior art? Okay, so it's pending applications based on prior art. That, that, that's where you're thinking about patentability. Okay, infringement is something totally different. Infringement re relates to issued and enforceable patents and relates to actual products. So the question here is, does the accused product or process have all the elements or equivalents of at least one claim of the issued and enforceable patent? Okay, so one thing to note here is that it's only products are actually performing certain methods. That's what infringes. You know, you can have a patent application a patent application does not infringe an issued patent. Okay, you, you, writing an article does not infringe on on, on, a, on a on an issued patent. It's only when you perform specific methods or you have specific products that meet the elements of the claims of that patent that's when there's infringement. 
And what people will then ask is, well, hey, I'm, you know, I have this product. Should I do an infringement analysis to determine whether I'm infringing on somebody else's patents? And you know, again, that's a, a, a kind of a, you know, a, a, a natural thing that people would think is something that you would want to do. It's like, well, hey, you know, I don't want to go out there. And I don't want to have this product where I'm going to be shut down because I'm infringing on somebody's, uh, uh, somebody else's patent. But strangely enough and counterintuitively, this is not a standard part of the inventing process or part of you know, drafting and filing patent applications. Infringement analysis is absolutely not part of that. And strangely enough, you know, again, you, you don't you don't get you get really low return on investment from all the time and effort you spend on it. The, the, the nature of the analysis is really expensive and time consuming and difficult, which you know comes down to you know it being really, really expensive in terms of attorney time. And a lot of times, you know, you're really not going to get good actionable uh, in information. Okay. So infringement is in the details of the final final product. That's what's in really important to understand. If you have a general idea for a product, you can do this broad patent search, but it's going to be in the details of how you actually implement that product or methods related to it and how they compare to the very specific claims of somebody else's issued patent. That's where the analysis is. And so you can try to do this analysis early on, but you're not going to get very good actionable information because you don't have the specifics of the product to compare to the patent claims. Plus, if you're doing this sort of this big, broad search, you know, I mean, you're looking at thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars to do this general search and all this analysis. And it's so speculative because you really don't know what your final product is. Okay. Also, keep in mind, you know, these applications are secret for 18 months um, and potentially all the way up until the patent application issues. So you could be doing this infringement analysis, you know, on pending applications and issued patents, but something that's totally relevant could totally you know be hidden from you you may not know it even exists so there's still going to be a huge blind spot even if you're doing you know some sort of uh, you know doing some sort of infringement analysis you can never know for sure also even if you find patent applications that seem to be relevant those patent applications may, may never issue as a patent the, the you know the, the the patent applications they may be rejected and the uh, the folks may not be able to get over the rejections or they may just run out of money and give up Okay, so you know you find these patent applications that are relevant. They may never even issue a patent as a patent, and may never even be enforceable. Also, keep in mind that the cost to enforce patents is really, really, really high. And so, even if you would theoretically uh, infringe on a patent, somebody would have to file a patent lawsuit. They would have to file an attorney. It's a very expensive thing to do, and a lot of times people don't have the resources to file a patent application. Um, you know, unless. You know they can have it done on contingency, and there's for sure infringement. And usually, infringement isn't a clear-cut thing. It's going to be in the gray area, and you're going to have good, uh, you know, non-infringement non -infringe, non defenses and even invalidity defenses. That's typical, and so you know it, it, it can it can be easy to sh you know a lot of times shut those sort of lawsuits down. Um, so you know the cost to enforce stuff is really really high, and so even if you do theoretically uh, infringe on something. It's not likely that you're actually going to be sued. On on the other side of that is, you, let's say you do this big analysis and you say, "Hey, we're not infringing any of these patents." It doesn't mean you're not going to still be sued. I mean, I've dealt with litigation where, you know, people have definitely not been infringing, and the people on the other side say, "Well, hey, we disagree. We'll see you in court. We're going to take this to the very end." And it becomes a business decision where it's like, "Well, let's just pay these people off. They want a small settlement." Why drag this out? This is part of their business plan on, you know, kind of extorting money out of people with patents. And even if there's not really good, a really good case for infringement, a lot of times people can extort money out of people. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be free from these infringement lawsuits. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, just create the best product that you can. And if you happen to be one of the rare people who gets caught up in sort of some sort of patent litigation, one, realize that you know it's 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 totally rare. You 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 kind of won the crappy lottery, but at the same time, at least you're on somebody's radar as as a successful company. That's a good problem to have. You know, a lot of times people aren't even on anybody's radar. They wouldn't know what, you know what, what you're doing whatsoever. Okay. There's there's an exception for a targeted analysis. If, for instance, you have a there's one competitor that uh, you are really aware of and you know about specific patents, then it can make sense if it's if it's really targeted to a specific patent or maybe a specific competitor. Um, especially if, for instance, you you are really using a lot of what they're doing as inspiration. Um, you may want to be really careful about what you're doing, and if you know that you're trying to design around certain products or patents, 
then you may want to do some sort of infringement analysis. And it can make sense a lot of times for larger companies who who know that they're going to be devoting a lot of money to these products. So for individuals who have a small product, you know, it, it's 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 prohibitively expensive to do this sort of analysis. You know, a lot of times, you know, doing the search is going to be, you know, as much as, as probably your revenue for, you know, for a long period of time so you don't get a good return on investment. Also for startups, well, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily know what their product is initially. They don't have the the money to do these sort of analyses. I want to finish off with talking about the early stage issues and these are some of the most important things that you need to know when it comes to inventing and developing ideas. The first is you have to understand that you should not make public disclosures, public uses or offers for sale until you file a patent application. Um, so patent rights start to be lost upon a first public disclosure, public use or offer for sale. In nearly all foreign countries, you automatically lose your rights upon a first public disclosure, public use or offer for sale. In the U.S. and some foreign jurisdictions, you have a, a one-year grace period or maybe a six-year grace period where you, know, you have to file a patent application within that time period, otherwise you lose your rights. But a lot of times, you automatically lose your rights. So the, so the best way to do it is file a patent application, again, before a first public disclosure, public use, or offer for sale. All right. You should also file before talking with investors. And a lot of times this isn't going to be considered a public disclosure, public use offer sale that's going to forfeit patent rights, but it really improves your pitch with investors. Okay. So you can go into the pitch meeting saying, hey, we're patent pending, and you can be more open and talk to them about the technology. That can be really important. Okay. It makes, you know, ma makes things a lot more comfortable. It, it improves the, the pitch substantially. What you don't want to do is go in and say, well, hey, you know, we're going to file patent applications. I can't talk about this. I want you to sign an NDA. And you know, hopefully you know this, but that is totally pegs you as a newbie who doesn't know what they're doing in the eyes of investors. They're going to look and be like, hey, we, we, we don't want to work with you. You know, you, th th this, is, this, this is not a legit company. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, you know, they don't understand how things work. Okay. So, you know, you, you ideally then should just, Hey, file a patent application, go in, be able to say your patent pending. All right. So you got to understand that it, the U S is no longer a first to invent system. And you would think that that would mean, Hey, we need to rush and file patent applications immediately. But like I said earlier on, that's not the case. A lot of times it makes more sense to wait and file, defer the costs related to filing that initial provisional application, to filing the non-provisional a year later, to the examination process. So again, there's the, it's, the, it's the four triggers, public disclosures, public uses, offers for sale, and before you're going to approach investors. That's typically when I recommend folks actually file patent applications. Okay, and this one is really, really important. Probably one of the most important things that I'm gonna talk about is that inventors must affirmably assign their patent rights to a company. Okay. So just by being an employee, just by being a partner in the company or, you know, being a, a contractor, things like that, that does not auto automatically mean that those inventors are required to assign their patent rights. And what can happen is you file a patent application. This person says, well, I never assigned my patent rights. We don't have any employment agreement or any sort of, any sort of contract or, you know, in sort of a collaboration agreement that says I, I assign my rights. I'm going to hold on to this and then you effectively you know lose control over the patent that person owns a share of the patent and they can go out and they can you know they, they can license the technology around your back without your permission okay so you lose control and obviously that is really unattractive makes you radioactive in the eyes of investors so you want to make sure that you don't do that it's really easy to protect yourself all you have to do is in any sort of agreement you have again whether it is employment agreement a collaboration agreement partnership agreements that all patents and IP that's generated goes to the company. You just have a clause that says, you know, I hereby assign my, you know, my rights in any, uh, in any patentable subject matter to the company. It's usually a pretty simple clause. Talk to your attorney about it, but usually it's pretty simple, but you have to have that in there before you start collaborating with people. Okay. So with all these things, talk to a patent attorney early. So, you know, you, you have a software product or you have a, uh, you have an idea. Is that patentable? Talk to the patent attorney. A lot of times it can be free or it can be really, really cheap to do an analysis and to plan out a strategy about, hey, is this patentable? Am, am I ready to file a patent application on this? Okay. Talk to a patent attorney early. It makes a lot of sense just to make sure that you're not, you know, forfeiting your patent rights, but inadvertently doing something like public disclosures, public user offers for sale that are going to forfeit your patent rights. And that it's very Goldilocks. You know, you want to make sure that you're filing at the right time. You're not filing too early, but you're not filing too late. 
Okay, so thanks for watching and check out some of these other videos. Um, I got a couple of other ones here that are gonna be really good additions to this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again in the next video. Thanks.